Hello, and welcome to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Hugh Ross. I'm joined by our president, uh, Fazrana. Um, we'll be your guide today as we explore uh, different topics that uh, we'll be discussing. But before we get into these discussions, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, and click on the bell icon so that you can be informed of our new videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. Let's start with you, Fuzz. Uh, you got a lot of really uh, curious-looking slides that I'm <laughs> interested in uh, enjoying. So uh, yeah. what's, what's the discovery? Yeah, well, it's going to be about uh, chimpanzee behavior. Uh, but to ease us into the, the discussion, I think all of us who've had pets or who've interacted significantly with animals really appreciate that these creatures can be quite intelligent. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and they display... Uh, really some uh, an emotional richness that I don't think is oftentimes fully appreciated. You know, I r- remember this uh, English bulldog that we used to have. Archie. Arch- Archie, I remember yeah. Archie. <laughs> yeah. And he was, that's, this bulldog was a lot of fun. He was just filled full of personality. But one of the things that Amy and I taught him to do is to ring a bell that was hanging on our sliding glass door if he wanted to go out into the backyard. And so sometimes he would ring it, but then he went through a stretch where he just stopped ringing the bell, and he would just sit there until we went and opened up the door, and we thought, well, maybe he didn't really learn how to use the bell. But then one day, there was a cat in the backyard, and he wanted to go out there to chase the cat, and he's just wanging away <laughs> at the bell, like, hurry up, hurry up, get me out of here. But, you know, that's just a, you're, you're just a fun story that just, you know, again, reminds us that you know, animals are really, you know, much more impressive than we oftentimes may think, right? And 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 that has actually some really important uh, theological well, quest- let, implications. Let me say, share a story. Okay. Because, uh, <laughs> Kathy and I were in Gibraltar uh, before COVID, and on the rock of Gibraltar, there's all these macaque monkeys, and they're really smart, and they're very good at picking pockets. <laughs> Uh, but they seem to know that a passport has really high value, <laughs> and they know the difference between a cheap watch and an expensive watch uh, or a wallet. And uh, so uh, they will pickpocket from you, and they'll wave it in front of you, but they will not give it back to you unless you give them a high-quality treat. And if you want your passport back, you really better give them a really good treat because if you give them some cucumbers, forget it. They're not going to give you the passport back. But it's like they've been engaging humans long enough to be able to figure out. They don't know what a yeah. passport is, but they know they can get a really good mm-hmm. treat yeah. uh, if they bargain uh, with that passport. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's it's not just these anecdotal stories, right? But it's it's also a lot of work that's being published now in the peer review literature by animal behavioralists who are really documenting with some scientific robustness, you know, animal intelligence and again, emotional capacities, you know, animals are able to engage in problem solving, a a type of technical inventiveness or creativity, Uh, again, remarkable creatures. And as I mentioned, this has theological implications and philosophical implications. So people like our our friend Nathan Lentz, who uh, was here at Reasons to Believe this summer, he participated in a workshop on human exceptionalism. He's an atheist and is of the view that really humans only differ in degree, not kind from other creatures, and wrote a book called Not So Different, where he kind of summarizes this idea where he says, all the impressive human cognitive abilities evolved in ancestor species that already had an extensive palette of emotional states. In order to understand how our ancestors made the jump from animal behavior to human psychology, we must first recognize that the distance of the evolutionary jump is not as great as it seems. You know, so again, you know, how do we make sense of 
these kinds of insights in, in light of our view at Reasons to Believe that humans are made in God's image and because of that really are exceptional and, and stand apart. And, you know, you mentioned macaque monkeys, uh, but, you know, there's also been a lot of work done scientifically observing chimpanzees in the wild. Right. And some of the things that have been discovered in the last, you know, decade or so are rather remarkable. You know, chimpanzees, for example, have been observed manufacturing spears. Yes. And it's like a six-step process where they take a tree branch and shape it into a spear that they will use to hunt with. They even sharpen them. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And, and you know, they also make tools to extract termites from nests. And these are not just, these are, again, modifying sticks in such a way to enhance surface area. It's pretty clever what they do. They utilize stones as a tool to open up nuts. Uh, they exploit wildfires. This is really remarkable. This was an observation made by Jill Pruitts at Iowa State, where she and her team were out in the field observing monkeys and a wildfire broke out and she and her, her team didn't know what to do. They had no idea how to move to get out of the way of the wildfire and the chimps were literally walking right up to the wildfire and just effortlessly moving as the wildfire changed directions and they were using this as a way to get grubs and other things out of the ground that were left behind where the fire had burned. And she was of the opinion that if they had opposable thumbs, they could probably have harvested the fire and, and made opportunistic use of it. So interesting stuff. Uh, chimps have been observed occupying caves, fabricating beds where they will take tree branches and they have the, the right tensile properties. So they select certain branches from certain trees with the right tensile properties. They'll incorporate... Uh, uh, vegetation that has insect repellent properties, pretty impressive. Uh, they mourn their dead. They make use of, of plants for medicinal purposes. They even have been observed creating an insect paste that they will use to treat wounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, remarkable creatures. And again, you know, in, in light of these kinds of discoveries, you know, people will look at something like this evolutionary tree and they'll argue, well, because tr chimps are our closest living, you know, uh, ancestor today, that that clearly this capability that chimps had is really a, an antecedent to the remarkable behaviors that we engage in as humans that we think makes us exceptional. And so, adding you know to all of this is a recent paper published uh, about the use of chimp uh, about chimpanzees utilizing high elevations to gain information on rival groups and then making tactical decisions based on the information they gathered. And, and this is part of um, something called the Thai Chimpanzee Project. It's been going on, I believe, since 1979. And it's essentially looking at uh, and observing and studying the chimps uh, in, the coast, in the Ivory Coast uh, in a place called the Thai National Forest. Mm -hmm. And this particular study involved uh, uh, observers that, had, that were studying two different groups of chimps, um, and they, these chimps had become habituated to the observers, the human observers. And this was over the span of 2013 to 2016. These researchers recorded 21,000 hours of observations. Wow. So, I mean, the, the level of, of work, they were in, in the field 10 to 12 hours a day, and what they were trying to do is, again, monitor the chimp behavior with regard to rival groups. And chimps actually have territories. Right. Uh, the territory size can vary from about, oh, five square kilometers to about 35 square kilometers. The borders are not really well defined. And so the, the chimps will obviously have larger groups that occupy larger territories. And there is an advantage to expanding territories, that which makes sense, more resources, greater opportunity to grow in number, which makes that, that chimp group much more resilient, you know, as a, as, a, as a tribe or as a group. And what these researchers did is they attached GPS trackers to themselves. So as they were observing the chimps, they could actually map out the territories. And then they uh, were... Um, 
overlaying the territory map the territories they mapped out on top of top topographical maps so they could get elevation information and then they just simply monitored these chimps as they engaged in border patrols and things like that the chimps will break off into subgroups apparently and they will actually monitor the borders so they they defend their territory and they look for opportunities to expand it as well and when they're adjacent to rival groups they'll actually have excursions into the rival territories and sometimes will fight with the their rivals they'll even kidnap members of the other group and kill them and things like that so not not necessarily the nicest animals you know but you know th- this is again the 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 kind of the background for for their observations and so this is the the map of the of the territories the two that, territories yeah uh, for what they called the south group and the east group mm-hmm. and uh, one of the things that chimps do is they'll have these hoot calls and they'll bang on trees. So this is a picture of a chimp banging on a tree, and and that's how they kind of establish their presence, you know, in their territories. And and you know, the, you can get information about numbers from the, you know, the 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 sound of the calls and the the banging. Uh, and now in the forest, deep in, in the forest on the ground level. You can pick up these calls about 500 meters away, but at higher elevations, you can pick up the calls over a kilometer away. What the researchers observed is that the chimps would actually climb up to higher elevations to get information on, on their rivals. And they, they noticed that uh, they would tend to much – they would be much more likely to climb higher elevations as they were moving from the central part of their territory towards the border regions – and less likely to do that when they were actually going from the border regions to the central area of their territory. And at these higher elevations, they couldn't really see into the dense forest, but they could hear. So on these higher elevations, they noticed that they would essentially rest. They wouldn't feed. They wouldn't move around. They would just sit still and they would rest. And so they assumed that they were listening for information about their rival groups. They also noted that when they did climb higher elevations near the center part of their territories, they weren't quiet. They didn't rest. So they they thought that this was something that they were deliberately doing. And then uh, if they could hear the chimps in their rival territory, they were much more likely to enter into the, bound, the, the border area, the boundary area, uh, or go into the rival territory the further away the chimps were. So they, they actually were able to plot out the, the likelihood of moving into the territory as a function of the, the distance of the other groups. So they're on top of this hill or peak. Right. They're listening to what's going on in the rival group. When they notice the sounds are far away, they say, oh, we can go into the border territory. Right, right. So, you know, the, the, and so the obvious advantage there is that in exchange for expending energy to climb the higher elevations, they're getting information that they can then utilize to avoid conflict. Right. So even though they will fight with one another, it's much easier to simply avoid conflict altogether. Right. And, and so these chimps are gathering information and then making tactical decisions and uh, about, about rival groups. And so the researchers are pointing out that this is the first time this kind of behavior has been observed in animals other than, other than humans. Humans will use high elevation to gain information about rival about We rivals. do see that in birds, though, don't we? Well, you know, it, now it's – what is uh, – it is true that other animals will exploit higher elevations to get information about food, to, to avoid predation, to right. observe – predators. So there's like a sentinel behavior. But they argue that this is going one step further where they're gathering information and then they're subsequently making tactical decisions based on that. Like going into the border area and right. getting some extra food. That's, right, yeah. right. Now, you know, w- one of the things that, you know, immediately comes to mind is, you know, I, I think they they are recognizing some pretty remarkable behaviors in these chimps that's that's pretty sophisticated but i think their their connection between that and what humans are doing seems to me to be a bit of a, an anthropomorphism right where they they are attributing human like qualities to these animals 
uh, and assuming that they're doing something that's like us or that is an antecedent to our behavior. You know, so I don't necessarily buy that. But what they're arguing is that this this may actually uh, be something that shaped human evolution. That you know, in addition to using higher elevations as you know, hominins moved into the open savannas uh, to avoid predation or to get an advantage in hunting. That this may have even been a, a tactic that was used to be able to engage more effectively rival groups. So in- interesting observations that, again, uh, these researchers are arguing is more evidence that really humans differ only in degree, not kind. You know, and, and again, you know, I think one, we have to be careful about anthropomorphisms when we look at this kind of data. But as remarkable as this behavior is, you know, I still think that there's a a big cognitive gap between humans and chimps, right? I don't, you know, nobody's going to confuse a chimp with, you know, with a human. There's a huge cognitive gap there. And, you know, there's a, a growing number of anthropologists who would embrace an evolutionary perspective who are arguing that really humans are indeed different in kind, not different in degree. And one of them is Thomas Sudendorf. And I love this quote. I cite it all the time, but it's worth taking a look at here because he he's, you know, essentially comparing chimps with humans, right? And his whole point is that, look, humans are doing incredibly sophisticated things. We've put people on the moon and, you know, the chimps are about to go extinct, clinging, you know, desperately to the the remaining forests that they're able to live in. And no observed technological advance. Right. Nothing yeah. like that. And so he's arguing here there's got to be something that's fundamentally different because, again, from an evolutionary perspective, humans and chimps share the, a common ancestor. And so chimps are essentially the tip of that evolutionary lineage from an evolutionary perspective, and we're the tip of another evolutionary lineage. And he's arguing, look, uh, there's something fundamentally different about humans and chimps in order to explain really the the different predicaments that we are in as humans versus chimpanzees. You know, and and so his argument and others is that it's symbolism, mm-hmm. right? That we we have symbolic capabilities and uh, I'm going to skip this quote, but he, uh, Sudendorf argues that th- this capacity for symbolism is a game changer, that, that while animals might be able to communicate, humans have open-ended language where we can express uh, a, a near infinite number of thoughts and ideas because of our ability to combine and recombine symbols, that animals might have memory, but we have this capacity for mental time travel, right? Where we can not only remember things in the past, but we can go back in the past and envision alternative scenarios that we could then live out, or we can anticipate what's coming in the future and and envision alternate scenarios, you know, or, um, you know, he also mentions that animals have social cognition. We have theory of mind. Animals can solve problems, but we have this ability for abstract reasoning. Animals have social traditions. We have cumulative culture. Animals have empathy. We have morality. And he's arguing, again, for each of these pairs, one isn't just simply a predecessor to the other. There is a fundamental difference between, let's say, empathy and morality. And that difference is made possible because of our capacity for symbolism. So as the point here is that as remarkable as these creatures are, and we don't want to minimize that, uh, to argue that this is an antecedent to what we're doing as humans is really not, is not a, a correct way to think about it. Well, especially when we see these kinds of behaviors manifested, not just amongst the primates, but amongst other animals. Mm-hmm. It's like, I mean, the argument I hear is, well, the primates are doing this. Uh, we must have gotten the similar behavior by common descent, um, which is why I mentioned crows. Yeah. I mean, uh, crows will have a sentinel that will not feed, but just be on a high perch, look out, and uh, be observant and give warnings. Does that mean that we're descended from crows? So, so the fact that we see these kinds of behaviors, not just in one species, but in multiple species, minutely different, 
I mean, I think we even see that with the primates. We're mentioning macaques, or the capuchin monkeys, mm-hmm. or the uh, orangutans, the chimpanzees. They all manifest amazing behaviors, uh, but they're a little bit distinct from one another. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, it's not just the chimps. We see this. Right. In fact, I just was reading one paper where they said, I think we made a mistake in identifying the chimps as the smartest of the non-human primates that are alive today. Uh, the orangutans do things chimps can't do. Yeah. Capuchin monkeys do things that chimps can't do. So uh, how can we say that uh, there's this common descent idea? And I think that's interesting that we do see something in the morphology, but if we see something different than behavior, uh, then we have something that's out of right. sync yeah. with a common descent argument. Yeah, I, and I, I think that's really well said. You know, and on a previous episode, I think maybe you were on the episode with me, we talked about the work of Johan Lind, who's a, a Swedish animal behavioralist. And his argument is that a lot of the remarkable behavior we see in animals can be explained through associative learning as opposed to what we're doing as humans, which is, again, this open-ended reasoning um, Right. that when we solve problems, it's, it's <clears throat> because of our capacity for mental time travel – Whereas uh, when animals solve problems, it's through associative learning. And his inspiration was looking at AI systems. Right. I mean, AI systems, which are based on machine learning, are in effect, it's associative learning. Right. Right, where the rewards and the punishment or the upvotes and the downvotes, you know, as the AI system responds to things. And AI systems can learn to do some pretty remarkable things. And his point is, is that, you, you, we might expect the same thing with associative learning in animals, and he's designed these computer simulations that are able to replicate the results of a lot of these animal intelligence studies where animals are solving problems and in, in, in even engaging in well, creative behavior. I find it behavior. interesting, too, that the associative learning that we see in the more cognitive animals, it's enhanced when they're bonded to human beings. Mm. So there's something about them having a relationship with us that makes them more effective right. in their associative learning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, I, I think that's an interesting point, you know, because we're, th- not only are they bonded, but then we're involved in, in training them, right? right. We know we're, we're able to give, I think, unique types of rewards and punishment to animals. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I learned with, with my bulldog is he was much, much more receptive to positive feedback than to, to any kind of punishment. So I learned quickly that, you know, I was, I rarely c- would correct him. It was always through. Has anybody ever been able to correct a bulldog? <laughs> no, you can't. I mean, it's their, their personality, but he responded quite well. To we, rewards. To rewards. Oh, right. Yeah. And he would, you know, and so you could do a lot to, to train him or to encourage the, the, you know, the right behavior just through rewards. I think that works in some of our children too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It does. So anyway, you know, I, I think it's a, a fascinating study that has, uh, again, some really interesting implications. And it's unfortunate that so oftentimes these studies are marshaled in favor of trying to argue for common descent and really minimize or undermine human exceptionalism. But when we think about it a little bit more carefully, it's very clear that we st- even though these animals are doing incredible things, still humans are stand apart from these creatures. They do, but I look at these amazing animals and say that testifies about the creator, the mm-hmm. fact that he created this incredible variety of very high-capable animals. Uh, but I think it's not only he enjoys that, but he wanted us to enjoy it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the Bible tells us he, he created those animals for us. Yeah. So uh, I'm... I'm not at all surprised yeah. that they manifest these amazing behaviors. Yeah. I mean, it makes our pets much more enjoyable, right? Yeah. yeah. And moreover, it makes our agriculture easier that we can use these animals uh, mm-hmm. to do things for us. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's great, Buzz. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got something that's in a totally different discipline, and uh, it's a research study that just got published. Uh, in fact, it's not. Uh, it's still just available as a, a, an e-print, but it got peer-reviewed, and so it was basically uh, put up uh, ahead of print at uh, Nature Astronomy, and uh, it's a new test 
of uh, Big Bang creation models. And uh, you know what's amazing is that as exhaustively as the Big Bang has been tested and how wonderfully it's passed all the tests, you still got people doubting the Big Bang. And so, but, you know, as I read the paper and saying, well, I've been around long enough to realize why they're doubting the Big Bang, the philosophical and theological implications uh, are quite potent. I mean, when the Big Bang was first proposed, you had leading astronomers and physicists around the world saying, we can't have this. It really looks like what the Bible is teaching about the beginning of the universe mm -hmm. and how God is designing the universe. So there's a lot of pushback against the Big Bang. That pushback continues to this day in spite of the overwhelming uh, tests that have been applied to the Big Bang, which is why astronomers are still committed. Is there another way we haven't thought of of testing the Big Bang? Because you've got atheists who don't like the Big Bang. You've got young earth creationists who don't like the Big Bang for opposite reasons. Atheists don't like it because it makes the universe too young. Young earth creationists don't like it because it makes the universe too old. Uh, but, you know, as I've noted, even before I became a Christian, the Bible says some explicit things about the origin and the history of the universe. Mm -hmm things that are very much the fundamental features of Big Bang cosmology. And so I think these early astronomers were correct. Big Bang sure looks a lot like what the Bible teaches us about the universe. So what are some of the things that the uh, Bible explicitly says about the universe that resonate with the Big Bang? Well, the beginning, for one. That's yes, the right. most obvious one. Yeah. The universe has a beginning. And uh, before Big Bang cosmology was proposed in the early part of the 20th century, astronomers were saying the universe is eternal. So Big Bang was basically challenging mm -hmm. the idea of an eternal universe that it has a finite age, it has a beginning. And the Bible also tells us that the beginning of the universe is not just the beginning of matter and energy, but the beginning of space and time. And so one of the developments of Big Bang cosmology are the space-time theorems, which basically say if we live in a Big Bang universe, uh, with gravity, with quantum mechanics, and general relativity, even space and time have a beginning. And then the fact that the laws of physics don't change. I mean, that's something that's a crucial platform of Big Bang cosmology, mm -hmm. unchanging laws of physics, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible tells us that decay is pervasive. Mm -hmm. Moreover, it's extensive. It's a high-level decay, mm -hmm. not a low-level decay. And that's what's in Big Bang cosmology, very high entropy. So we got the universe with a high level decay. The universe is expanding. Uh, you got 11 passages in the Bible that mm -hmm. talk about God stretching out the heavens. And, you know, this is a core feature. A universe that gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. So there's a lot more that the Big Bang says, but these are things that actually were pre-stated mm -hmm. in the Bible thousands of years ago. And if people are interested, I got an article on the internet at reasons.org uh, written this year where I basically talk about what the Bible says about the Big Bang and the debate that theologians have had about how much or how little it says about the Big Bang. So people mm. get to see mm -hmm. the whole spectrum of debate. So it's up there at mm. reasons.org. Uh, they can find it easily. Uh, but what I'm going to want to talk about is this paper where they said, we found a way to test the Big Bang that no one has ever applied before. Mm. And it's basically looking at galaxies in the local universe. And the reason why they focus on the local universe, uh, when, you're not, when you're looking just tens of millions of light years away or 50 million light years away, we can actually observe these galaxies and determine their morphology in great detail. Okay. I mean, everybody's excited about the James Webb but it's looking at galaxies 12 and 13 billion light years away where you really can't discern much about the details of the galaxy. It's very different when we're looking, say, in our local super galaxy cluster. Uh, but what was in the literature uh, decades ago is that in a Big Bang universe, you're going to have roughly the same spatial distribution for galaxies that are of the same mass. And so... They kind of jumped on this. Well, number one, the galaxies that are easiest to observe in terms of their morphology uh, and mm -hmm. uh, their uh, structure are the big galaxies. 
And so they said, hey, what previous researchers claimed is that uh, big spiral galaxies will have the same spatial distribution as big elliptical galaxies. Now, I've got some slides here. Let me see if I can... Uh, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the closest big spiral galaxy to our own galaxy. And uh, so it comes in at about a trillion times the mass of our star, the sun. So it's definitely a big spiral galaxy. And you can see how the stars are distributed along a disk. You can also see how the stars are spread out in the sense that they're oriented along these large spiral arms. Right. Uh, the extent of this is about 150,000 light years from one end to the other. So they're just really spread out. And then I want to move to what we call an elliptical galaxy. Let me move down here. Okay. This is what's called a giant elliptical galaxy. And uh, this galaxy is actually considerably more massive than the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. It's several trillion uh, times the mass of our star, the sun. And what you notice is the stars are all jammed tightly together. Mm -hmm. And the size of this, in terms of its spatial diameter, is actually smaller than the disk of the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. But way more stars and uh, you know, much more mass. And so, and then has a shape that's either spheroidal or ellipsoidal in shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have large galaxies in these two categories. They're either spheroidal, ellipsoidal, or they're disk galaxies. So like with a spiral galaxy, is most of the mass in a plane? It's in a plane. Whereas right. in an elliptical or spheroidal galaxy, it's... kind of like in a ball. Okay, interesting. And the ball is much more compact. So you've okay. got the stars jammed tightly together. Uh, in an ellipsoidal galaxy, or as a disk galaxy, the stars tend to be spread out along the disk. That's the main difference. So that would explain why, <clears throat> in part, why you need to have spiral galaxies to have a life support planet is because of that density of stars? Yeah, if you got a huge density of stars, uh, that means the more you get exposed to radiation from the big stars that are nearby, and you've got the stars so close together, they gravitationally jostle the planets that are orbiting uh, those stars. That's why, you know, life is not conceivable in a globular cluster. Mm. What we see in our own spiral galaxy, there's 152 of these uh, globular clusters where you got mm. this 100,000 to a million stars jammed tightly together. Uh, you know, we happen to be along the disk uh, far away from any of those globular clusters. Mm. But, you know, what the study was basically saying, okay, is it really true uh, that Big Bang cosmology predicts that you get the same spatial distribution of spiral galaxies that you do uh, with ellipsoidal or spheroidal galaxies? And so this is a group of uh, European astronomers, and they used a Finnish uh, computer simulation uh, called Sibelius. And everybody knows that Sibelius is a, a famous Finnish uh, composer. And so this is called the Sibelius Dark Computer Simulation. And so they use this uh, computer simulation uh, to look at Big Bang cosmology in the context of what would happen as the universe expands in the context of the local universe. And basically they looked at the entirety of what's called the Lanakaya Super Galaxy Cluster. And I think I've got a little, yeah, here we go. This shows you uh, and this is a two-dimensional map. It looks different in three dimensions. But basically you see that uh, the a, a supercluster is a cluster of clusters of galaxies. And in the case of the one that we live in, uh, you've got really dense clusters of galaxies, big ones like the Virgo cluster and the Centaurus cluster that you see off to the right. You've got the Fornax cluster to the lower left, the Hydra cluster to the lower right. Those are the biggest and densest of the clusters. And what's not obvious in this particular map is that these really big, dense clusters of galaxies tend to form a plane. Uh, so just like our Milky Way galaxy is a disk-like structure, the super galaxy cluster we live in also has, not to the same uh, mm -hmm. degree, uh, but you do see this uh, concentration of these really big clusters of galaxies along what's called the supergalactic plane. And so in running the simulation, what they discovered was something surprising, namely that Big Bang cosmology predicts uh, that you're going to get uh, the large 
uh, elliptical galaxies predominantly concentrated along the supergalactic plane, and you're going to get the spiral galaxies mm. in isolated parts. So once you get above the plane where there's not a lot of other uh, big galaxies and galaxy clusters around, you've got a higher probability of getting the disk mm. galaxies. So they're basically saying the previous assumption uh, that the spatial distribution would be the same is not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get a higher density of elliptical galaxies in the supergalactic plane and a higher density of spiral galaxies in the isolated parts of the supergalaxy cluster. Then they conclude their paper by saying, well, this has some relatively obvious physics implications, is that where you've got a high density of matter, uh, what's going to be happening, you're going to get these big galaxies forming. And if they are spiral galaxies, you're going to get merger events. Mm. We've already seen when you get, say, two big spiral galaxies merging together, frequently they collapse into a spheroidal galaxy. Mm. The galaxy shrinks, and you get all the stars moving in towards the center. So they said, on that basis alone, we would expect to get a fairly high density of giant elliptical galaxies. Then these large elliptical galaxies, they will merge and become giant elliptical galaxies. Mm. That's not going to happen if you're in a less dense region of the supergalaxy cluster. The probability of the merger events is significantly lower. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also a place where a disk galaxy can preserve its disk structure. Mm. As long as it's able to feed on small dwarf galaxies, it can sustain its disk structure. So it basically says where we see the disk galaxies and where we don't see them uh, actually makes sense from a Big Bang perspective. Mm -hmm. And But what they really concluded is there's Sibelius dark computer simulation of what you would predict from a Big Bang uh, creation model perspective perfectly matches the observations mm. of the local universe. So they conclude their paper saying the Big Bang has passed yet another test. Mm. So we, we come up with a brand new test no one's ever figured out. But just like all the other tests, the Big Bang passed it uh, with flying colors. Okay. Uh, which means from a biblical perspective, this is good news. The Bible is the only holy book that even mentioned mm -hmm. uh, any of the features of Big Bang cosmology. So it's basically evidence yeah. that of all the world's holy books, the Bible got the cosmology right and yeah. predicted it in advance of what astronomers discovered. Yeah, that's, you know, continues to amaze me, you know, even all these years later, is is the scientific prescience that you see in Scripture. Right. You know, that, and, and that, uh, you know, I was uh, just working on a blog article about, um, you know, mass extinctions and mass originations in, in life's history, uh, more in the context of people complain that, God must not be a great designer because of all the extinction right. events, you know, in, in life's history. But, you know, I, I finished up the article by talking about Psalm 104, you know, in verses 27 through 30. Right. You know, and there's a bit of a debate among theologians as to whether that cycle of life and death and rebirth is referring to just, you know, daily occurrences in ecosystems, or is it actually, you know, referring to something like the history of, of life on earth where it's in making reference to mass extinctions and mass originations. And the, you know, the argument for it referring to again, mass extinctions is a, is an interesting and a sound argument. But the point I'm trying to fumble around to make is that it's not a big leap to say, this is actually talking about mass extinctions and mass originations. Well, it isn't fuzz when you read the rest of Psalm 104, because right. the rest of Psalm 104 is speaking about properties of life that are not obvious to any human observer. Right. What's obvious to all human observers is plants and animals die and reproduce. So I look at those last few verses of Psalm 104 and saying, it's talking about more than that, because look at the rest of Psalm 104. Right. Well, and there's a very clear connection to Genesis 1 with the 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 word ruhach, which is right. the spirit of God and and the idea of bara being used which means to originate something new. Right. So it's it's clearly, you know, seemingly to have a deeper meaning than just what's happening on a daily occurrence in, in it's ecosystems. It's not just reproduce, it's right. recreate. Right. Yeah. But it's again it's remarkable because <clears throat> 
you know, there's just absolutely no way that that David, presumably who's the author of Psalm 104, or the people that are receiving that psalm would have any concept of mass extinctions and mass originations. Yet what's being described there seems to, to be a pointer, a very clear pointer to something in Earth's, Earth's history that we've only recently have uncovered. So there's this, this almost prophetic nature to the creation accounts in Scripture. Well, I kind of look at Psalm 104 as God packing our planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, and as broadly as possible. I mean, the language of Psalm 104 really brings that out. Uh, but that would imply that God is also wanting to pack our planet with life for as long as possible. For that to be possible, you need mass extinction events yeah. and you need mass speciation events. Otherwise, you've got a narrow window right. in which life can exist on Earth. And we humans are the beneficiaries of God packing the planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, as long as possible, because that provides us with all the biodeposit resources we need to launch civilization right. and use that civilization to take the good news of salvation to all the people and groups of the world. So I kind of look at Psalm 104 as having a redemptive message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But again, you know, it's just amazing how when you spend a little bit of time working through these creation passages and thinking about them carefully in light of the original language, how how often they seem to be pointing to something beyond what uh, what the original author would have understood. Well, right? you get that in First Peter that these uh, Old Testament prophets were being inspired to write Scripture that they themselves longed to understand, but recognized this was for a future generation. Yeah. So it's like they knew they were being inspired in some amazing way. Yeah. So yeah, remarkable. Okay. Well, thank you, Fuzz. Hey, thank you, too, for joining us today in Stars, Cells, and God. Join the discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. Uh, new episodes of Stars, Cells, and God release each Wednesday and are available here on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend. And remember, the more we learn about science, the more we learn about the record of nature, God's book of nature, the more reasons we have to believe in the inspiration and errancy of God's book of Scripture and in Jesus Christ as Creator, Lord, and Savior.